So all right, let's yeah. So uh, my name is Gabriela Constantino, and I represent Lifestyle and Design Cluster from, from Denmark, who is a part of the Fascinate project, a European uh, project that will uh, my, uh, my colleague uh, Christian Moscarti from uh, Cluster Digital in Spain, who's uh, one of the partners of the project, will uh, tell us about in a minute. Then we'll have a presentation by Mick uh, Stroyberg from Good Monday. And then the last presentation will be by Lars Olsen from Better World Fashion. So as I said, this is being recorded. You can ask all questions in the chat. And now I'm gonna give the word to, uh, to Christian. Christian, can you share your screen? Okay, I'm not muted anymore. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Fantastic. So I'm going to share the screen. <clears throat> okay, once you're okay, I can start just making sure you see my screen. Yes, we can see the screen. Uh -huh. Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much, uh, Gabriela, for the introduction. Um, I'm Chris Muscardi from the Cluster Digital, one of the partners of the, of the Fascinate project. I think it's important to explain what the project is all about. Uh, and basically, it's a framework that is bringing us here together with uh, the Circular uh, City Week, which is a fantastic uh, festival and environment to showcase what, what we intend to do. Uh, Fascinate, as you can read here, Sustainable Fashion Alliance for International Markets. It's a COSME project funded by the European Union and, and which obviously important objectives that I'm going to be sharing with you uh, uh, later on. Um, Fascinate represents uh, the EU European fashion and textile industry, uh, which is a strong, uh, strong industry worldwide, uh, at least in, in Europe, uh, it represents 160,000 companies, which employs a, a minimum of one million and a half people. Uh, of all this uh, industry in structure, uh, almost 90, almost 100% is represented by micro and, and SMEs. Uh, this is a, a graphical explanation of the, of the EU textile clothing value chain. I mean, basically it's concentrated on fibers, yarns, fabrics, but also finish uh, textiles and clothings, uh, which uh, feed uh, three main uh, market destinations, the fashion and clothing, furnishing, and uh, industrial and technical. Um, fascinate is targeting fashion uh, industries, you know, the textile part dedicated to fashion, and, and, and it, it's aligned within the uh, market, uh, European market, and at least 65% is linked to clothing and fashion. Uh, currently, the European industry, which is has been running for several centuries, I mean, nowadays is experiencing important changes. One of the uh, innovation trends that experiencing is uh, moving from commodities to, to specialties, uh, or this, I mean, having as uh, as uh, end markets um, sectors or products that are more much more technical. Also, there is a trend of uh, moving from uh, mass production to customi customization, which brings a much higher added value service to the, to the sector uh, and also make uh, EU companies uh, much more competitive, right? Uh, in, in terms of direct benefits, <clears throat> all these new trends that have been developing, developing for the last years it has allowed to stabilize the the manufacturing base and employment in Europe. It has, it has also allowed to, to increase research, innovation, education and training efforts uh, for the industry. And obviously is, it allows growing exports. Also an, another peculiar uh, aspect is that um, it has invert, inverted one of the trends in fashion, which, which means that many production activities have been reshoring in the sense that have, have started back to be 
to be done in Europe. Why we are explaining this? We're explaining this because these are the current trends, but there are gonna be much uh, more transforming aspects in the coming years. One is the introduction of digitization in, in many of the, of the different process of the, of the value change of the fashion and the textile industries. Also is the, the introduction or, or incorporation of sustainable and circular economy principles in the different, not only the processes in the materials, in the business models, etc. And finally, again, a, a proliferation of new business and consumption models. This, this means that the, 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 the sector is changing enormously towards this, towards this aspect that I just uh, mentioned. And this is, Having explained this context is where Fascinate comes in. I mean, Fascinate uh, is, a, as I said, a COSME project. Uh, COSME is a framework of funding in the European Union that uh, in finances projects that uh, try to, to, to develop and make more dynamic some specific ecosystems. Fascinate is targeting the fashion and textile ecosystem. And, and the object, one of the main objectives is uh, developing um, circularity and sustainability in the fashion and textile industries. But at the same time, uh, generating cross, uh, cross sectoral collaborations with technology and the footwear sector. This way, um, through this partnership of five different clusters in Europe, uh, what we want to do is uh, generate or identify new value chains that can allow these European companies to go abroad, to, to export or to share a knowledge or to collaborate with uh, SMEs, uh, companies, uh, stakeholders uh, outside Europe. Uh, to do this, the project is going to um, develop a, a joint international internationalization strategy. Uh, within this strategy, we, the, the partnership is gonna will define uh, target countries, uh, but um, one of the important aspects is that is not only to export EU projects uh, products uh, in the fashion and textile, uh, but also to generate collaborations and, and, and in future synergy synergies with uh, companies from from these target countries. This is a graphic graphical explanation, very simple, but is. It's a very simple project because basically we have defined different phases. Uh, the first one uh, intended to analyze the European fashion and textile sector in terms of a SWOT analysis to understand uh, which is the current status of the, of the market. Then we have conducted just now um, a workshop uh, where, where we uh, try to define new value chains. It was a very collaborative uh, exercise where there were uh, companies, uh, clusters, uh, many different actors, you know, trying to, to, to run this kind of analysis exercise. And another additional uh, action that we have just launched is an uh, international market study. Uh, this is a public tender that we published today, and, uh, and I'm going to be sharing more details about it in, in the next slides. Uh, additional uh, activities that the project uh, has planned is training uh, and capacitation activities for EU uh, fashion and textile companies and participation in international events. Finally, the, the, the main goal is defining or designing this joint internationalization strategy to bring EU uh, textile companies uh, to third countries, but also to foster this collaboration with other markets in the world. And uh, also it, it will require uh, defining a sustainable governance and legal form uh, for, the, for the partnership in order to be able to operate beyond the end of the project. Um, this, is a, this is a textile explanation of what I just uh, said to you. Uh, this is a summary of the new value chains workshop that we conducted last week. Uh, as I said, it was an exercise that invited uh, uh, SMEs in the fashion and, and textile industry uh, to run this exercise of first identifying areas and, and challenges of the sector. Uh, and, and that generated a lot of different uh, inputs and insights and ideas that, that after that uh, allowed the new generation of, of 
value chains, and finally conduct a prioritization and selection of the of the best ideas. The, the, these uh, new solutions, new value chains that we think that could bring uh, good values and, and new business models to the to the industry. Uh, finally, as I mentioned, there is this uh, market study public tender, which is open to, to any company from around the world. The objective of the, of the market study is uh, to develop a diagnosis of possible target markets. Uh, amongst the ones that we indicate in here, we're looking at, after a previous analysis, we think that either Canada, China, Japan, Russia, or USA can be potential markets in order to, to create collaborations uh, and find synergies with companies uh, implementing sustainability and circular economy principles. And there are you know, additional details that we will, we will love to share with you later on uh, or within the link uh, below. Uh, I think that um, Gabriela, we're gonna be sharing the slides later on. Uh, so you will be have access to all, all of this. And finally, we are inviting all of the, not only the participants today, but uh, all the related industries in fashion, uh, textiles, sustainability, circular economy, to, to be involved, to, to stay in contact, because uh, this is a phase one of the, of the project, which is defining this uh, joint internationalization strategy, but rebuilding, rebuilding the blocks in order to, uh, to, to uh, develop a phase two, which is activating this internationalization uh, strategy. So we, we love to hear from, from current companies, uh, get inspiration, uh, sharing knowledge and, and build this up together. And that's all, thank you very much. Sorry that I've spoken so fast, but time is, <laughs> time is important here. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, and uh, you can, ask questions in the chat. Otherwise, you can also uh, contact us on, on later on if you feel like uh, you wanna learn, uh, know more. And um, yeah, so now we we'll proceed to the next presentation uh, by uh, Mick Stoiberg. Uh, Mick Stoiberg has a passion and uh, expertise with scaling companies. And uh, over the years, Mick has created several startups uh, and also has uh, successfully exited from these. Uh, for example, Lemon Squeeze uh, was a company helping Danish firms enter the US market uh, located in, in New York. And uh, in 2017, Meek uh, launched Good Monday, a workspace management platform with the mission to empower businesses uh, to create better workspace uh, experiences for their employees. So uh, welcome Meek, uh, would you be so kind to share your screen? I will. Hi, everyone. Great. I just learned that I don't know anything about what you know everything about. <laughs> it's nice. It's, not, it's nice to, to learn something new. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. I can't go into full mode, apparently. So you'll see all my slides on the left, but I hope that's OK. So just to follow up, uh, Lemon Squeeze actually um, helped uh, European companies and Asian companies enter and expand into the US. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, first of all, let me just share a few words about the journey we took to the US and how everything started. So back in the days of 2010, I worked for a company called Issue, which is the world's largest uh, digital publishing company. They had around 10 million uh, viewers uh, a month and we wanted to bring it to a billion, oh, a, mil, uh, a billion viewers uh, every single month. Um, and we looked into what we needed to do to actually get to that point. And one of the things that we had to do was to get the big publishers on board. And they're all located in the US. And then there was also educational and governmental um, uh, publishers that we needed to get on. So I actually went on a flight and I had the honor of being um, head of global partnerships and PR and marketing. So we went to the US and I went to New York and I actually moved there and we set up an uh, issue with a small team of five to 10 and scaled it up. Got like New York magazines and VES and all the other ones, Washington Post and so forth on the platform and actually scaled it up and reached our goal. At some point we moved the company to Palo Alto. Apparently if you're tech, you need to be in Silicon Valley. So we moved all our employees, but also the entire setup to Silicon Valley 
And at that point I was 30 years old. So not old enough to be in Silicon Valley, which is kind of like suburb mentality. So I actually relatively fast moved back uh, to New York. And one of the things that I noticed when I was setting up uh, issue was nobody actually knows how to set up a company overseas, how to scale it, how to get a product market fit and how to reach a point where I actually feel comfortable in maneuvering into new markets. So I started a company that only did that. The only thing that we did was help companies into a new market, make sure they have, they had traction and then scale up their brand to make sure that they were actually uh, extremely valuable. So we did that with around hundred companies from 24 different uh, countries uh, and got acquired in 2017. At that point, uh, I got two kids in the meantime, and I promised my wife that when all of this is done, because we're working a tad hot, uh, we would go to Bali for a year and relax a bit. But I had this idea because I had an acre of office space. And it was so difficult for me to run it because there's so many things you need to take care of when running a big office. There's all like 50 different service agreements and office suppliers and service providers, contact people, termination periods and so forth. So it was actually super difficult for me. And I ended up spending 50% of my time running the office and not running the business, which kind of sucked. I still wanted to do it personalized the office. I wanted to make sure that it had a B2C vibe. So it was the things that I did at home. I could actually do that at work because to feel at home at work is actually pretty difficult and it takes a lot. So I flew back to London, Copenhagen, Paris, uh, Berlin and Oslo. And I talked to potential suppliers, potential clients and potential investors and got a green light. So in November 17, I flew back to my wife in New York and said, what if we instead of Bali go to kind of shitty Copenhagen in December? Would that, are we going to get divorced? Is this going to be okay? And she actually gave me like, you, you, you get a year <laughs> and then we have to go to Bali. And that's three years ago. So at some point that will happen. But we went back, started Good Monday and went on this big journey. I'm just going to take you through Good Monday. Then we're going into the scaling exercise because opening up a new, uh, opening up a company is actually a part of the path. I'm going to get back to that. So just so you know how Good Monday works. Can you all see the headline saying now more than ever people need the office? Yeah. So something happened through this pandemic, right? We all want to be together and working from home is so fucking last year. And we're all in this whole, how do we develop? How do we get closer to each other? How do we actually make sure that we can find each other and actually be relevant and present in what we do? So the pandemic kind of taught us two things. People want, employees want to feel at home at work. And we also want to democratize office management because 80% of all office managers lost their jobs through this pandemic. And it's kind of natural. It's kind of like an evolution. And it's something that we were looking into before the pandemic actually hit us. But how do you do that? Because it's super difficult. One thing is when you run a company and you, a lot of you probably do, you know that it demands systems. Systems is something that unleashes true potential. And it's also something that makes it easier for people to be with people instead of people being with something they shouldn't. And we see that in all the different, so if you hire someone in sales, you give them a sales system because they need to work as productively and efficient as possible. You also need them to be happy and they're happy in the whole interaction. You do the same in finance and in marketing and HR and all the other departments. But office management has kind of been standing still for 50 years. If you hire an office manager, you say like, I don't need a system, I have you. So people are kind of degraded when they're running an office. We knew this before the pandemic. That's why we started in 18. We saw what was happening because if it can't be the place where everybody is together, that it's something where um, it's a place where you don't actually give them the time and benefit of it. In 1926, I'm going way back. In 1926, Henry Ford invented the 40 hour work week and we haven't changed it. We haven't done anything. It's kind of go to work, work, get your salary, go home, pay your rent but it's just changing so fast because now we can also work from home. We can do all the stuff that we love and we need to kind of compete against the home office. So we have to do it more inspirationally and we have to set it up. It's just difficult. And now we built hopefully the world's best workplace marketing platform. And I don't know if uh, this is going to work, but let me try. Can you all see a man with hats on? Yes. 
Running is this an playing? office can be a yeah. hassle. Yeah. You juggle a ton of stuff while trying to find time to do your job. Remember special moments, seasonal happenings, and putting out fires while new ones arise. Damn, that's a lot. You want to feel like the office hero you are and make sure that your office makes people go, nice. Yay, wow, sweet. don't worry. Running your office just got easy. With Good Monday, you're always in control and you'll have everything in one place. One point of contact for all your services and providers. Full financial overview, invoices and category spending. Calendar, covering all your office activities. All office services, coffee, snacks, cleaning, handyman, Friday drinks, even cold rosé or events when it's the season. Best of all, it's easy peasy. Go find what you need on the platform. Pick your favorite qualified and vetted service providers. Except that's it. Now go show your people some love. They need their office hero. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if it was just me, but I, I kept seeing them the same men with the with the heads, but I could hear. So Ah oh, fuck it. That's a shame. Yeah, but we will send don't the slides. Afterwards. Uh, to yeah so but basically we have one system to run everything all contacts in one place and we'll make sure that you have vetted uh, service providers that actually take care of everything we have all the best partners and suppliers on board and then we've baked in a marketplace to make sure that you can have all the inspiration that you need because right now inspiration is the big thing of how you actually get to the next point so the reason why we did this is because everybody who's been working in a co-working space know that it's excellent because you come in, you sit down and you work. You don't take care of coffee, food, cleaning, alarm systems or anything else. You just sit down and you concentrate on your business. The problem is it's, your, it's not your name on the wall. It's not your parties. It's not your color coding for whatever you do. So you don't really feel yourself. At some point you graduate from co-working. You're your own company. You need to be you and all the employees needs to feel you. So you get that whole brand and identity you have your beer on tap, you do what you do, you throw the parties that you wanna and it's your thing that you're living in, which makes it easier to build a product. The problem is now you have to take care of all those service agreements, contact people and so forth. So what we did was we took the infrastructure, which is pretty analog from co-working, flexible offices and so forth, put some fairy dust and some unicorn, something on it, made it digital and pushed it into all private offices, which is still 99.8% of all office market. So now if you have four walls, it can actually be fully serviced as if you were in a co-working. We also have a lot of clients and so forth. I'll move forward through this. So covering new markets. The reason why I told you this story is one, because I wanted to show you how cool it is what we just built, but also just because the way that we actually started Good Monday was based on, let's just say that we're going into a new market and we already exist in a former market, a test market. Because if you treat your company like it's brand new and the marketing needs to go in and hit someone, it's actually great because everything goes in loops. So this is going to be a tad like up there, but see if you can follow it. The way that we see market expansion is actually through um, a ramp like this. Does anyone know what this is or not know what this is? No. So the cool thing about this is it's all about mathematics. What comes in goes out. You have like these two transactions and then you have a flat. And if you look at it through how to enter a new market, it's actually the same. So we built Lemon Squeeze based on this skateboard ramp, on this half pipe. First you have activation, then you have validation and traction and growth and scale. And in the whole, let me see if I actually have one. No, in the whole activation part, there is getting an IIN number. If it's the US you're going to, it's bookkeepers, attorneys, it's addresses, it's all the stuff that you need. After that, it's figuring out who is, who would be the people who already were in contact with the decision makers you need to talk to, find them so you can get like a head start on everything, unboat them with your DNA, probably fly them to wherever your headquarter is and then get them started. Validation is traction is just keeping a movement every single day, figuring out not a product market fit, uh, but a go-to market fit. How do we actually go out there and create value extremely fast? And when you reach the last point of it, now you know that when you hire two more people, six more people, 12 more people, it's going to 2X, 4X, 8X, because you know exactly what the process is. At that point, 
you come to a place where the value of your company is so much higher. So I tried to draw this when Christian uh, asked me to do this and I, I can draw. So just bear with me. So a baby pipe, that's when you come from a small uh, country like, uh, like Copenhagen uh, or from Denmark or Copenhagen, somewhere, right? Where we have a small market and it's easy to get started in Copenhagen. That's also why I, I chose Copenhagen before we went into London, because there's easy activation. I know exactly what to do. I know people, I even speak the language. My obstacles are super known. I know exactly when I'm going to hit a trap or a rabbit hole, and I know how to get out of it. I know my decision makers. I'm close to them, but they're slow scale because we were like 5.8 million people and there is a limited potential. It is a super test market. A bus pipe, we just go into like this, still this half pipe metaphor, is super difficult. It's difficult to enter the US because the activation of all these things are super difficult. I actually think I have a slide on it. There's unknown obstacles, everything happens and then a lawsuit and then something else and something about your brand and you don't know what to do and a registration that didn't, uh, that failed on the way. You have no market knowledge because you don't know how they interact and you don't know your decision makers in the same degree as you do at home. But there's a fast scale when you've validated your whole go-to-market and there's an unlimited potential in all of this. So the what the fuck pipe is more about how you can actually enter the market, but where you think you're entering it, but you're actually just wasting your time. This is something that's pretty Nordic actually, but it's also from some of the Baltic countries and Italy and other places, because what they do is they fly in once in a while and they're kind of like, we're in the US or we're conquering Asia. But what they're doing is just tiptoeing into it. They're not doing it full blown, which will always fail. So there's a long activation and there's no momentum and there's no scale. So it's the same as if the half pipe only had flat and there was nothing going in between. So the what if pipe is actually when you can get this head start. It's if someone can help you on the way to actually go down into this boss pipe and get to the right point. So somebody that helps you know the obstacles, somebody with market knowledge, somebody that knows the decision makers that then can help you fast, uh, make the scale fast and also give you the unlimited potential. So this is all about figuring out who to hook up with. This is a presentation from Lemon Squeeze. So I'm, I'm, so sad, I'm just presenting what we had back then. But this is all about figuring out if it's not lemon squeeze, it's someone else. So someone who did it, someone who actually knows what to do and then going full in with those people. And there is just known people who've done this several times that you can hook up with. And sometimes it's a tad expensive, but it's not more expensive than failing in a new market, which is time consuming and money consuming as well. So in bear of time, just going to have these few things. So we helped 100, uh, 100 companies, 22 of them got acquired, and we have uh, probably 55 who are active and still scaling. So the first one is actually to make the decision. It is if, you, if you're doing it, you have to do it or else you'll end up on the what the fuck pipe. You want to be on the bus pipe and you want to have help. So if you don't make the decision, you're kind of like just tiptoeing all the time. You're just taking away focus from your coal market, which is your home market. You're not going into the new one. So just make the decision. The next one is actually about milestones. Figure out what you want to reach and then reach them. Don't make them too big. Make them extremely small. Make them on daily or weekly basis. There's no reason to be like, when I hit 2022, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to be the biggest. Say like, when I reach Thursday, I'm going to have these clients. I'm going to do this. I'm going to reach out to these people. And I want to set clear, like it could be two meetings by Thursday but set the milestones, have them in broader perspectives of daily, weekly, and so forth. Do an OKR setup or whatever you want, like objectives and key results. Stick to the plan. When this happens, something will happen. And people will come in and say like, can you do something special for me in this? Could you set up something? If you change your material, if you do something like this, then I could buy it. And sometimes you just get derailed. So it's about setting a plan and then sticking to it instead of doing a Hail Mary and suddenly just reaching out when you see something that's shiny. And we all do it because we want success. And we want the small successes because we just want to survive. And we just want to show our wife, our lover, our kids and everybody else that we're actually good at what we do. Cost is everything. So expanding into a new market is just super expensive. It's not just expensive on uh, dollars 
and what you actually pay. It's expensive of your time and your energy and what you have to put into it. My best guess is a lot of you are founders or at least you're in this founder group where you need to know exactly where your energy goes. And I don't want to sound like a cliche, but where energy goes, um, uh, focus flows. And there's just something in that where you just need to know how you do it. Do what you do best is all about what I said when it comes to <clears throat> don't think that you need to be a bookkeeper or an accountant or someone that finds real estate or someone that does anything else than what you do best. If you're a designer, if you're a founder and a CEO, if you're something else, make sure that you can actually give away some of the responsibilities because if you don't do it, suddenly you'll be wrapped up in doing stuff that you're not good at, which is going to take way too much time. And the math is pretty clear. You can actually do a budget. If I spend a month on this, that somebody else could spend two days on, like, does this make sense? And if there is founders out there, we all think that our time is free. If I do this, it's not going to cost anything, but it's just super expensive to waste your time on something that you're not good at. If you don't look at your company life cycle in where you're at, you're going to die in it. You need to know when you're actually creating traction. You need to know when you're creating transition and you need to know when you're growing. If you don't know this, then you're going to stay in the whole traction part and you're not knowing when you're transitioning into the new part of your company. And a lot of failures between small companies is actually they can't see when they reach a milestone where they have to do something differently. So you need to know within your milestones, when are you transitioning your company and when is it actually growing? When do you need to put money behind it to make sure it can reach a certain point. Don't give up is kind of like given, but you want to give up all the time, especially in a new market. And I've seen it and I've seen more than a dozen founders cry and it's okay. We all do it. <laughs> I've been, <laughs> been lying in my bed crying with a glass of red wine that I spilled all over the place, but, and it's okay. It's just difficult. And it's difficult to try to grow a company, especially if you're not on home ground and there's no one to support you. So you just have to remember not give up. So this is something that was in a bathroom stall in New York when I almost gave up with my first company. And I think it's kind of beautiful. And I know it was written with a pen. I know that it's um, wrong to write something in bathroom stalls and you can't do it. I just felt the soul of someone who actually put this down, especially because 60% of everyone that lives in New York are not American. And more than 50% of all the Americans living in New York are not from New York. So there's just been this lonely soul who's been sitting there. And I think that this is something that is extremely accurate. I don't know if you feel it because maybe you've tried it, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, you can't feel this. If you have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's extremely emotional. And I think that's it. Sorry for being so high level. I just like in 25 minutes, I can't go into details. So if you need more from me, just let me know. This is my email. Thank you so much, uh, Mick. Uh, I, I like the high level. It was really uh, energetic and dynamic. So thank you so much. Um, so you can ask any questions in the chat. And I there's one question here I will read out loud, uh, Mick. So what is the most important lesson you've learned from helping brands becoming su successful in the US? And do you find th th that different nationalities have different obstacles? Uh, so, so yes to the, to the latter. And I think the reason why I chose the name Lemon Squeeze is not because we wanted to make a juice bar. It's because when in Europe, when you say squeezing the lemon, it's because you want to get more out of something that you actually deserve. When you say squeeze the lemon in the US, it's because you want to make lemonade. You want to get everything out of your potential. And we don't know that. So in America, people are just standing in front of the line. They're skipping you all the time. And we're just super polite. We're waiting for our turn. We want our product to speak for itself and all that bullshit. In America, you just go up in front of the line. So there's something about being pushy, believing in your product and going forth. So if you're extremely polite, it's just going to fail. So the things that I've seen, and there is a big difference between countries, also in the mentality of if you don't want, like I'm going to be stereotyped only based on the companies that I've helped. I hope that's okay. If you go south, Mediterranean Sea, there is something, if they don't like our product, they can just fuck off. If you go to the north, if they don't like our product, is there anything we should change? And in this whole realm, 
there is an in-between. There is something like we're proud of our product, but we're listening to what you're saying. And I think a lot of the Mediterranean companies that have failed is because they're too stubborn. A lot of the Nordic companies that we've seen failed is because um, they're too polite in their whole setup. Uh, there's also all the stuff that I happened. They don't, they don't know their cost. They haven't been 100% active in actually entering the new market. Uh, fail hires because they didn't look at, uh, so let's just say you're selling um, vintage t-shirts. Instead of just hiring someone in sales, if you hire someone who's been selling vintage t-shirts for the last five years to all the companies that you want to get into their stores or anywhere else, he probably has a Rolodex of 300 people that he can call the first week to give you validation on it. Why hire someone who's never been in it? So there's something in knowing the decision maker before making the hire and making sure the hire knows the DNA of the company that you're bringing to the table. And that's like one of the biggest fails in everything. And that that's in company life in general, not just market expansion, it's just uh, wrong hires. So you need to know, is, is there someone that I can actually benefit from, from the get-go? All right, great. And I was thinking like, do you see a big difference on like, uh, depending on the product, which uh, sector or industry it is like, for example, now we're focused on fashion and textile products, but, but is there a big difference if you're selling uh, like, uh, I don't know, something within the electronic uh, sector? Yeah, so the biggest difference is how you actually use network and how you hire. So the biggest difference is, um, there's so many different ways of selling. So either you're an e-commerce or you go through agents or you go through something else. And what we saw with fashion was that agents is such a big part of it. But what you want to do is get started um, on everything that you do. Also with agents, find the ones who've been selling probably from your own market and that you have validated and then see if you can transform it into being yourself handling it through your e-commerce. So going from agents, hand-on, analog, to growth hackers and e-commerce. So we've seen that big shift. And there's like running a tech company who sells SaaS solutions, like uh, service, um, service solutions online, to selling uh, t-shirts or trousers or something else. You, you can't compare them in any way. What you could compare is the activation. You need the company, you need the setup, you need the bookkeeping, you need to have two different accountants, you need to have all the setups which is super difficult if you don't know the process, but if you know the process, it's super simple. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I can see there's another question. In general, as an entre entrepreneur working abroad, what would you change if you could turn back time? Jesus. <laughs> I would change so many things. Like there is so, I, I made so many mistakes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of them where um, the mistakes I made actually uh, was beneficial for me in the long run. One is educating yourself or just learning and growing. And the other one is I was super naive. I'm still super naive, but I was even more naive back then. And if I had known what I went into, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm. So I'm also super happy that I got slapped in the face instead of not doing it. So it's so difficult. I, but one of the things that I really wanted to have under control was to have more stuff under control, to actually pay mm -hmm. myself out of stuff that I tried to do myself and just doing the math on how much will it cost me and how expensive is it if I don't succeed. And I think that's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, now we need to... Uh go to the next speaker, but thank you so much. It was great, uh, a great pleasure. And stay if you want, if you have the time uh, and uh, we will share a mix and mix uh, presentation with you guys. So the, now we're gonna go to, um, to Lars Olesen who hey is, guys. thank you so much, Mick, um, who is a, a, a partner and a chairman of the board in the Better World Fashion Company. It's a sustainable Danish brand, highly focused on uh, creating luxury designs using upcycling of post-consumer leather goods. And uh, Lars, I can see you. Would you uh, be so kind to share your, your screen? Yes, can you also hear me now? Uh, yes, we can hear you. 
Excellent. Right, just go to the beginning. Yes. Okay. So can you see my screen? Well, actually, no. You can't? No, maybe try and, and, and stop sharing and share again. Ah, sorry. Uh, let's see, two seconds. No worries. There's always, a, I mean, even though Corona has been a part of our lives for a year now, there's still some technical issues from time to time. I'll just try again. Otherwise, I can share it. But now there's something happening. Right. Let me know when you can see it. Yeah. Now, so, now it's there. Yes. OK, excellent. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to present here. I'm going to talk about Better World Fashion. And as uh, Gabriella said, we are producing uh, luxury leather goods from waste uh, materials, essentially. And uh, this statement here in, in the middle, I used to be someone else, actually has a double meaning, but I'll come back to that in just a second. The reason why Better World Fashion was started in, in the first place was to be a response to all uh, or at least many of the troubles that the fashion industry has with uh, fast fashion, creating waste, uh, and all these kind of things. So Better World Fashion was born in 2015 as a response to that. But before I go uh, further into that, let me just see if I can share next, please. Yep. So let me just present myself. Um, I'm Lars Olsen. And I'm partner and chairman of the board of this company called Better World Fashion. And uh, what is characteristic about me and the rest of the team is that nobody, uh, none of us has any kind of experience in the fashion industry. I'm a physicist of education and I have been doing a lot in, in renewable energy for many years. But uh, yeah, now we are trying uh, our best in the fashion industry with another uh, business model. So the agenda for I, what I will go through here is uh, essentially divided into three parts. So the first is just an introduction to the company. Then I will uh, present you for the products and, and why they are special. And then uh, the last part, uh, I will take you into our market strategy for how we have entered the international market and uh, uh, a little bit about the learnings from that. So the first point of the agenda, um, about the company itself. As I said before, it is, was born in 2015 and the idea was to demonstrate essentially that you can make a totally circular business in the fashion industry. So we have, uh, as a raw material, we have post-consumer waste. So going around in a circle here and the primary material is leather and that is uh, cleaned in sawdust. So we don't use any chemicals or any uh, water and we produce new products from, from these materials. And as we say, uh, they are 98% reuse and 100% unique. And I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Then our business model is also arranged in such a way that it actually supports the circular uh, uh, flow of material. So the customers, they can rent or they can buy our products. But um, a part of what we do is also to try to convince the market and especially the, the, the customers about uh, the way they think uh, about how they consume essentially. So we want to sort of change the mindset from new is good to having a story is good, having a previous life is good. Um, so that's also part of what we're trying to do. And then um, we close the circle by actually having a business model that allows us to get the, the products back um, when they, for some reason, are not used anymore. So that's also something I will come back into. Uh, in 2017, we applied for a certification as a B Corporation and, and uh, we were granted that. And we were also awarded Best for the World for the Environment in 2017. and. We were uh, on re also in 2018 for, for the same thing. Um, apart from that, we have a good um, press coverage. We have been chosen as a 
as a um, case study for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, also for um, a Harvard case study. So uh, we have had a lot of press coverage, you can say. Um, so let me just go into the products and tell you a little bit about that. So that's the second point on the agenda. Um, as I said before, the primary raw material is leather. Uh, but we also use uh, recycled uh, or remelted plastic bottles for, for um, the lining of our uh, products. And since we don't have a uniform raw material, uh, every product here is unique. So you can't find two leather jackets that are exactly the same. Of course, they have, may have the same design, but they are, they are made from different, um, you can say random, uh, parts of, uh, of leather that gives rise to a unique design. So sometimes you will even see that some uh, features from the previous life are carried into to the new life, like a zipper or an imprint or, or something. Um, so they are truly 100% unique and that's also what makes them stand out from, you can say, mass produced stuff. And what we create is, is bags. So we have three different kinds of bags at the moment. We have leather jackets. We are also going into the lifestyle uh, segment with um, aprons, uh, pot holders, and, and um, uh, oven mitts and things like that. So just a little bit about the, the details here because it sounds pretty simple to, to take some waste materials and then take it apart and, and make new products of it, but it actually requires that you design for that from the very beginning. So for instance, our little jackets are made of uh, 28 different pieces, which is rather unique. I mean, you won't find a, a virgin leather jacket of, of 28 different pieces, but of course, since we are creating a new leather jacket from old leather jackets, typically it's, it's two to three old leather jackets, um, then there's a, a size limitation, of course, and that um, that also in order to, to, you can say, create flexibility, it's, it's nice with smaller uh, pieces of leather. And the uh, lining of the jackets and also the, of the bags, that's made of uh, recycled uh, plastic bottles. And for instance, the uh, the harness for the suspenders or for, for the apron is made of Grandpa's old suspenders. That has actually been a, a little bit of a bottleneck for us. Apparently people they don't use so many suspenders anymore. So, um, but, but they are in, in Southern part of Germany. So we have a good supply down there, but I mean, it, it has taken a little bit of time to figure out where uh, NGOs actually collect these old suspenders. So again, every product is unique, not only um, because of, um, or put another way, you can say every time we actually make a product, it's a unique design process because we have to pick the pieces of leather that it goes well together into uh, the mix of colors you want or whatever it is. And sometimes um, that uniqueness is also something you're encouraged. So it doesn't matter whether you can actually see that there has been a previous life. So it carries a story and that story is actually unique for, for also, also the product. And that is also something we want to in, um, teach people in this idea about changing the mindset that the story is a good thing. If you have a new product, it doesn't have any story at all. So that's also why we have uniquely identified all our products. They are all uniquely uh, numbered. And this uh, Peter 0185 is actually my leather jacket that I'm wearing right now. Um, so, that's a little bit about the details. Now, one thing is that we try to, or we make these new products from a waste stream essentially, but we also try to keep uh, the materials in the loop, our own products in the loop, so we get them back after they are not used anymore. Um, and essentially our business model has two things built into it uh, that sort of guarantees that. Uh, First, if you start in the bottom, we have a leasing model. So all our products, not only the jackets, but all our products can, you can rent them for a minimum period of, of four months. For a leather jacket, it costs 20 euros per month. And there's a minimum uh, period of four months. 
and then you can essentially change it. So that's also a, our response to the idea in the fast fashion industry that you want to change often. But here you can actually uh, rent a jacket and after four months you can uh, send it back to us and we can ship a new one to you. And uh, so essentially we allow people to do what they like to do, change often, but we don't create any waste in, in, in that process. And if you rent a jacket, you will actually own it after 24 months. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we have an unlimited buyback guarantee. So it's not time limited in any way. It's not, uh, it doesn't matter what state the product is in. Uh, but if you send your product back to us, you get a 50% discount on a similar product in the same price category. So for instance, if you carry your leather jacket on a bike and you, you crash and it's damaged, you can send it back to us and uh, then you get a 50% discount on, on a new jacket. And the nice thing is that we get the materials back because some parts of the jacket will probably uh, be fine and we can use them for a computer Mac, for instance. So that's a, a way to, to close the loop. Good, uh, then let's go to the last point of the agenda. That is how we have entered the international market. Uh, essentially, Better World Fashion was born uh, global from the very beginning. We have had a, a web shop from day one. So everybody can buy from uh, our web shop on other mobile phone or a, um, a computer. And um, that's, of course, a nice thing that wherever you are, you can, you can buy our goods. The problem is that, I mean, it's not enough to put up a web shop. You need to create awareness about a product and the story uh, that you want to people to know about. So in 2016, we uh, created a Kickstarter campaign where we told about, uh, back then it was only leather jackets. We told about the leather jackets and uh, we got enough packers to actually have a successful campaign. Um, so one thing was that we raised uh, some money, but the other thing was that we actually raised awareness and we got um, known for uh, around the world. And that actually meant that we have sold to very many places. Um, uh, I don't know have the exact number, but I know that it's at least more than 35. It's probably more than like 50 uh, countries around the world we have sold to. And uh, the nice thing about this is that it, it doesn't matter where, whether you're down the street here or whether you are in New Zealand, uh, we have free shipping worldwide. So um, it costs the same essentially for you to buy it wherever you are. Um, of course, there's one challenge with this model. Uh, well, probably several, but I mean, one primary channel, uh, challenge here is that when you sell fashion, you make, have to make sure that it fits, right? I mean, you don't want a, a jacket that is too small. So we have, um, we have tried to make it very easy to actually make sure that it fits before we send a jacket to New Zealand, for instance. Um, we have not completely succeeded in that because some people, they, they are not looking too strict into our uh, guidelines for how to make sure that you get the right size. Um, especially uh, for the for the women jackets, it's a challenge. I don't know whether it's because our sizes are a little bit small or because people, they want to look smaller than they really are. But sometimes we have had uh, jackets we need to send back from the US and from New Zealand, for instance. So that has been a challenge that still is. Um, so that was the online sale uh, around the world, but we also have pop-up shops. We don't have our own shop, um, but we have had very many pop-up shops around Denmark for different events, but also in, in Germany. And that is with uh, great success. Um, when we are allowed to sell our products ourselves and tell the story um, and, and uh, make people feel good about the products because they understand that uh, there's no harm involved here then that is also a major part of the selling point. Um, I mean, of course the product has to be right. It has to be sturdy, look good and, and uh, fit and everything. But um, the final selling point is often the story. So um, that, is, uh, that is how we do it. Um, but we have also experienced that ordinary fashion retailers do not work for us. And 
Um, therefore, we only sell our fashion, I mean, our jackets directly to customers in other pop-up shops or online. And there are essentially two reasons for that. One reason is the cost price. We don't get our products uh, produced in Asia. We get them produced here in Europe. And that means that the cost price is many factors higher here uh, just because of, of the time and salaries that goes into making them. Um, so therefore, if you go to an ordinary fashion retailer, they expect that they can multiply the, uh, the retailer price with a factor of at least 2 to 2.5 or even more when they calculate the, uh, the customer price. But we can't do that um, because our cost price is simply too high. So therefore, the fashion, we want to sell directly to customers. Now, it's a little bit of a different game. So, so I mean, that's essentially uh, the reason why we don't go through ordinary fashion retailers. But we are building up a retail network here in Denmark, but that's mostly for the lifestyle products. Of course, we also want to sell uh, the fashion products in that way, but it's most easy with the lifestyle products. And that is, in this business, when you're trying to move the frontiers on circular economy and so on, you have to think differently. And um, it turns out that the best way to sell uh, our products via retailers is going to wine retailers, hardware stores, builders merchant markets. Uh, it can be hotels and restaurants, often places where they use the products themselves, for instance, in a restaurant where they carry the apron, or also in a builders merchant market where they also carry the apron. And people, they start to ask them, oh, this looks nice. I mean, where did you get that? And can I buy it? So um, that's one thing. That is that they don't have the same, um, you can say, uh, they, they don't need the same kind of profit at the, as the fast fashion uh, does because they intend to sell all their products. They're not burning some of it and, and, and need to pay for that. So, so that's uh, one thing. The other thing is that these kind of retailers, they have another advantage. And that is that they are good at telling stories. The wine retailers, if you go into a wine shop, you don't want to know something about the wine, where it's from and how old it is and how it tastes and all these kind of things. And these these um, shops, they're very good at telling these stories and people, they have time when they come in there. So, so that actually means that it's much more efficient for us to actually go via this kind of retail channels than, than ordinary fashion channels. Um, and another thing is that people, they, they, if they go into a wine shop, they sort of tend to use time in there. It's kind of an experience and we want to be part of that experience too. Right, and my last slide here is just um, to give you one more point, And that is that all our products, they're unique, but we are trying to build that story upon our products. And we also have an app in beta version where people, they can sort of build on that story for the individual product. But for instance, our computer bags, you can also customize those. We have this um, trolley strap that can be unbuttoned. It actually has a, a, a function. If you are in an airport and you have your bag on a trolley, you can, you can hook it into there. But you can also unbutton this thing and you, you can have a laser printed um, uh, a company logo or a statement or whatever you want. You can even have a number of those lying around and depending on your mood that day, you can put another one on. So that's also a way to personalize the product and maybe, maybe make people feel uh, ownership for the product. So with that, I will uh, close my talk and, and open up for questions. Thank you. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Lars. I think it was great to see like the, both how you work with the design process, which is quite different uh, when you work with the uh, post-consumer goods and, uh, and also sharing your experiences with both the, the, the selling and uh, the marketing and, and so on. So thank you so much. Um, I have a, I have a question because I think it's interesting. You started in 2015, and I was wondering how do you experience the these past let's say five years, like in the change of do you see any change in, con, in consumption uh, consumption uh, patterns and also sustainability? Obviously, has gone uh, like on the higher, much much higher on the agenda. I would say 
the last five years. So, and also now Corona, how, how would you describe the, the, the phases of these five approximate years for you guys? Right, um, of course, I mean, things are moving fast right now and it has also to some extent for the last five years. Of course, uh, sustainability is, I mean, is a big thing now, much more than it was back in 2015. So um, the funny thing is that many of our customers, at least when we meet them in, in pop-up shops, are not necessarily um, very aware about sustainability. For instance, when we had a pop-up shop in a tourist destination last summer in, in Denmark, it was in the back of a wine shop, but we actually had a, a pretty good sale. And we didn't, uh, pe people that didn't come to the shop because of our products, they came because they were interested in the wine and so on. Uh, so it was not necessarily people that were, you can say, had that special sustainability mindset, but they loved the story. And, uh, and when they see the point, um, that is, I mean, what makes them buy. And sometimes people, they go back and then after three days, they, they come back and say, hey, I mean, th this is really cool. I want one of these because then I can tell the story to my friends and colleagues and so on. Yeah. So, um, so in that way, it has not meant too much for us in, in that segment. But if we look into uh, to the online sale, there is a very big trend that these people that calls from, you can say, uh, around the world that have been looking for a jacket that they could defend. Um, that is rather unique. I mean, we, we see that more and more. And uh, that was probably not something we saw five years ago. But uh, I mean, just within the last week that I've been contacted by a person that wanted to check out whether the, the story was correct because she wanted a leather jacket, but she couldn't stand the idea about killing animals and all the stuff, uh, poisoning and, and so on, that's going polluting that is going on in, in, uh, in the leather business. Yeah. All right. Well, I can see we're, we're past um, four. So if, if uh, any other has have questions, I mean, they can contact you and and follow you on, on different SOMI and uh, also um, Meek before, and we'll send the presentation to you guys. So I hope that you enjoyed this, um, this event and you found it uh, interesting and inspirational and, and useful in, in some ways. So thank you so much, all of you. Thank you to the speakers and thank you for, for joining uh, this event. Have a lovely morning, uh, evening, wherever you are. Thank you.